did let grace appear. The hour I first believed, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Through I have already come. This grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. And we Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first So at this time, it is time for our call to worship, which is page 330. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful. For thee, take my voice and let me sing always only for my King, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would I withhold, not a might would I withhold. Take my will and It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord. Take myself and I will be ever only all. 
for thee, ever only all for thee. So at this time, let's kneel. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can gather here to honor thee as our God. We thank you for the intercession of Christ in the most holy place. We thank you for your promise and revelation where he said, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. We thank you, Jesus, that you're interceding for us this morning. We thank you for your power in heaven and in earth. We thank you for your power to overcome the enemy, to overcome sin in our hearts and lives. We thank you for your soon coming. We are praying that holy angels will be with us as we worship here today. That your spirit will come into our hearts and our lives. That he will stay there and reign supreme. Open your word to us today. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Our opening song is page 86, How Great Thou Art, and please stand. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior God to thee how great thou art how My soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, Sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden glad. 
gladly bearing. He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, Sabbath. It's time for our tithes and offerings, so I want to invite the deacons, junior deacons, up. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you have told us in your word that you want us to uh, honor you with the first fruits of our increase. And I pray that you will accept this as worship. And I pray that you will, ha you will give us wisdom on how to use it wisely. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now it's time for praise and prayer requests. Any, or, or just a, a testimony, something that happened to you this week that you're wanting to share. And, by, and for the visitors, our live stream is turned.
Is he still at home? No, he went back. I heard that he was here last week. I was hoping we would see him today. Anybody else? Pray for the, well, we have four families missing today, so pray for them. I think they're in West Virginia at a family camp meeting. So if nobody else, let's kneel and have silent prayer, and then I will finish. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for being with us today and for hearing our prayers. And we want to lift up. Okay, our scripture reading is actually is it Revelation three fourteen. Yeah. Scripture reading is Revelation three fourteen to twenty two. Revelation 3, verse 14. <clears throat> and unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write these things, says the, says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. 
neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, will I spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesaph, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the doors, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sat down with my Father in his throne? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. Happy Sabbath to you. I, my, you know, my occupation is not a, a being a minister, and I don't spend a whole lot of time uh, on sermons because life is so busy for me. That's why I bring so many books with me, so I don't really have a whole lot of time to make notes before I preach. So uh, that's why I bring along a little tiny library with me, so I decide what I'm going to use when I'm preaching here. But anyway, happy Sabbath to you. I'm glad, glad to be with you today. And... Um, I got an invitation to speak, and I was told there wouldn't be very many people here, and I thought, great, I want a, a little Sabbath off, so we'll have a small group, and I can <laughs> fellowship with a small group. Looks like almost a full house today, but nice to see you. And um, I, I don't mind talking to small groups. In fact, when I'm out canvassing, if I see a group of people, I'll, I'm willing to go talk to that group of people, but I much prefer talking to a smaller group simply because in those situations, it's easier to connect with people. But God has ordained preaching and there is something about preaching that is, uh, uh, God has said in his word that uh, he s actually saves souls through what he calls the foolishness of preaching. So, and, um, so I pray that the Holy Spirit will be here today with us, and I'm glad to see you. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about uh, what Tim mentioned and the canvassing work and the literature work in general. And then we're going to take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 3. So I'd like just to bow our heads for a moment. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much that you love us. We want to thank you for your word. We pray today that as we gather here for uh, the purpose to worship our God and our Savior, that thou will be with us. We ask that we will be taught from your word and that we will love Christ more because we have been here today. And we ask these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I, uh, maybe I did mention this to you here uh, as being a visitor at the church uh, during testimony time, but I just want to say something to you here. There, there was a friend of mine, a young man that I canvassed with quite a few years ago, and uh, he recently joined up some months back with a group of people in Tennessee near Knoxville that they, there was another Adventist publishing house started. Um, so how this occurred is evidently uh, some people knew a man, or at least Russ Thomas or someone knew a man in Russia who had quite a nice bank account, and he said, we'd like to have your uh, nice donation from you to help us get a, a, a printing press going. And the response of this Adventist man in Russia was, you got plenty of wealthy people in the United States, why are you coming to me for money? So after he gave him that response, he couldn't sleep very well at night, and he figured the Lord must be telling him he ought to be given some money. So I don't know how much the man gave, but I think it was well over the tune of well over a million dollars. So they got some land, they have uh, a printing press, a large web press, like it was run at the Review and Herald. Uh, that's in the building. I think it's about 20,000 
square feet, something like that. So they got some land, they got the thing up and running, but for, well, at least they were getting started, and my friend was hired to help with the project. So they were really scrambling around looking for someone to run this web press. It evidently takes some pretty, uh, pretty good smarts to do it and experience. They couldn't get anyone. Uh, previous people who worked at the review didn't want to move and so forth. So just very recently, um, uh, Russ Thomas was at a little Adventist church just three miles from where this uh, printing press is. And someone whispered to him, and said, he said, see that gentleman over there? He ran a web press for 30 years. And not only that, he trained people how to run a web press. The guy was, is 81 years old. He's a recent convert to the Seventh-day Adventist message through the ministry of Amazing Facts. And he was wanting a part-time job. Whew. Right there it is. Isn't that wonderful how the Lord opens the way? Yeah. So, you know, the printing press is a wonderful thing. And, uh, of course... We all need to be getting out the printed message. I remember some time back, I was visiting with a lady. It was an Amish lady. She had been a widow. She had, I think, seven children. She was a widow for seven or eight years. Somehow, she'd gotten her hands on that Natural Remedies Encyclopedia. A lot of you probably know about that. And she had been studying the, the Bible notes in the back. And, the, and she said to me, she said, that publisher, I think she was referring to Vance Farrell, she said, he's a powerful writer. And I think she was pretty well convicted of the Sabbath. I wish she would have been close to here. I would have sent her here, but she's quite a few hours drive from here. But um, I was able to leave a great controversy with her. And, uh, you know, God is working through this literature. I remember some time back I was in a home and an Amish man, he said to me, he said, have you ever heard of an author named Ellen G. White? I said, yes, I have. I said, I said, in fact, I was converted to Christ by reading her books. He said, so was I. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So um, a couple weeks ago, um, and I want to talk to you just a little bit about this thing that Brother Tim mentioned here. But um, once a month at, at, at the town square near where I live, Mount Vernon, uh, they block off the streets coming into the square in a surrounding area, and there's quite a few vendors and churches and all kinds of people. They set up their booth, and people are milling around. And so the, uh, in June, I was there, and, uh, uh, you know, it went okay. I, I was able to get out about 100 books in three hours. And, uh, in fact, I passed out about 100 of those uh, West Salem Mission brochures then, too. And... Um, in fact, at that time, I remember some teenage boys, they came by, they, and I gave them the brochures and the books, and they said, this is exactly what we're looking for. They were really excited to get it. So this last time, I guess I didn't go so well prepared. I had maybe a little over 100 of those brochures, and I figured, I, there's a lady that helps me, but she sits, kind of sits there. So uh, anyway, so I brought about 100 brochures, and I thought, well, just as a matter of routine, I'll bring three boxes, which is about a little over 150 Great controversies. Well, in 90 minutes, the brochures were almost gone, and the, I had about 100 books gone in 90 minutes. If I would have had someone else there uh, helping me, we could have at least probably doubled what we were putting out. There was just no way I could get to all the people. So uh, the streets, the width of the street is about the, the size of the length of this sanctuary here, and I'll, I'll give myself liberty to go up to the middle of the street. I, I'm a little bit aggressive, but I try to be extremely polite. And... Um, but I, I walk right up to the people, and as they're passing by, I'll say, sir or ma'am, whichever it is, I say, here's a gift for you. And if it's real quick, I just say, here's a gift for you. It's a powerful book. If I have a few moments, I'll say to them, uh, you know, here's a, here's a book that will show you what's happening to freedoms in America. It shows you how history repeats itself. It shows you the Bible's absolutely true, and Jesus wants you in heaven. So one man came to me. He said, yeah. He said, I know we're near the end of time. So he took the book. About 10 minutes later, he came back in the crowd. He said, you know what? He said, I'm a Christian. I said, I don't really need it. He said, I don't really need this book. I told him, I said, I would urge you to keep that book. I said, it will enrich your Christian experience. So he kept it and walked off. One lady was walking by, and I, I gave her my, the spiel, and I said to her, I said, um, ma'am, I said, this book will show you what's happening to freedoms in America. It will show you how history repeats itself, how the Bible's true, and it will show you how Jesus wants you in heaven. When I said that to her, she kind of broke. What I mean emotionally, just a little bit. She kind of broke. She said, she said I wonder if, if he really does. I told her, I said, ma'am, I said, the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I re repeated that text to her 
a couple of times, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I said, Jesus definitely wants you in heaven. She said, you know, she said, my husband's died. She said, all my brothers and sisters have died. She said, all my children have died. Can you imagine the hit? There are souls out there that need a kind word. They need encouragement. Um, this past Tuesday evening, I had been working in western Ohio, and I, uh, I was able to head home a little early. It was about 8.30, and I saw a car parked along the road. And um, you, you've probably fairly often seen these little crosses, you know, so you know something happened there. Well, there was a car parked right there. I thought, I'm turning around. So I whipped back around, drove off the road, put my flashers on, and went over to the lady. There was a lady and a boy there. And the lady said, my son was killed here, and the boy that was there was her other son, and they were just there, you know, having a few sacred moments of mourning. And um, I talked to them a little bit. The boy there was using tobacco. I gave him a tobacco book. I went back to my van, and I got a great controversy. And I got a Steps to Christ. And the lady really thanked me. So I'm really glad I stopped by. You know, sometimes when I'm driving down the road, I want a break. And I will tell you this. When I'm doing construction, I can work 12 hours and work pretty hard. I don't work that long selling books. There's a lot of energy in going door to door. And sometimes when I'm going door to door, if I can spend just a few moments in my van driving the next place, I'll take a rest so I can get rested up again. But the other day I was driving, I'm, I'm rattling too much. I got to get on to whatever. But I'll tell you this one more, and then I got to get on to this fest thing just a little bit. So anyway, I was going down a country road, and right at a corner was a lady sitting right by the street, and there was two little boys there. And I drove on by, you know. So I guess I'm a little bit lazy. I don't know. Anyway, the Lord said, you really need to go back there. I thought, if I don't go back there and I should have gone back there, I'm in trouble. So I whipped my van around. I went back there. And the lady was sitting along the street there. And she was actually babysitting these two boys, like six and eight years old. And so I had a nice visit with her. I gave her the great controversy. And um, she was glad to get it. I think I gave her another book. But anyway, she was smoking. I talked to her about smoking. And one of the little boys there, he was about six years old. He said, my bike broke. He said, my chain's off. I can't ride my bike. I said, well, go get it. I said, I think I can fix it for you. I had a screwdriver and pliers in the van. And so I tinkered around with it, and I thought, well, said, well, we got to take this guard off, so I took the guard off, and I said, look, I said, and so I put the chain back on, and I, and I told him, I said, I don't have the tools here to adjust your bike, I said, but if the chain comes off again, this is how you do it, so I showed him how to put the chain back on, they were so happy, so I trust that lady will be, uh, but you know, people need a word of encouragement. By the way, I really want to ask you to pray for this event coming up, as Tim mentioned, uh, we really have this brother's really stepped in and, and uh, he's going to help with money and books and we were going to do the best we could anyway but um, we could really use some help um, and if you want it I can send you a text I'm planning on having a meeting Sunday morning by conference call on the phone I can send you a text and give you the information we really like some volunteers to come we'll give you the information on the events and uh, the event but it is August 7th Sunday morning or excuse me Sunday at noon and onward um, tremendous opportunity. I'm asking that you will pray that God will really open this thing up for us, that the books can get out to the people. Because the people need this information. They desperately need this information. And um, now's the time uh, for us to really get it out. There's a statement here that I'd like to read for you in the book, Great Controversy, in fact, in connection with this. Um, it's found in the chapter, The Time of Trouble. I'm sorry, The Final Warning. And um, it says this. <clears throat> I'm going to read here just a little bit to you. The same trials have been experienced by men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that all doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged. With relentless fury. 
Yet they ceased not to declare the truth. They would not back off. Different periods in the history of the church have each been marked by the development of some special truth adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Listen carefully. These are inspired words. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. Then this statement. The Lord gives a special truth for the people. In an emergency, who dare refuse to publish it? The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency who dare refuse to publish it. He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. There is a responsibility here, brothers and sisters. Like the Lord told Ezekiel, if you don't warn the wicked and you don't warn the righteous, his blood will I require at thine hand. This is not take it or leave it. It's my talent or no. No, it's our duty. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to read to you more. This is so good. Maybe I'll read to you a few sentences. I want to read to you about what's going to happen during the final warning and then the time of trouble. It says, As the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of a God are again perplexed. For it seems to them that they have brought the crisis. But conscience and the word of God assures them that their course is right, and although the trials continue, they are strengthened to bear them. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. Their testimony is, we dare not tamper with God's word, calling one portion essential and another unessential to gain the favor of the world. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. Listen, the Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. Christ has conquered the powers of earth. And shall we be afraid of a world already conquered? I love it. You know, this book is especially dedicated to 144,000. I can prove it to you. Let's, um, let's go to um, the book of Revelation. I want to look just a little bit at chapter 3 today in the few minutes that we have here this morning. Revelation chapter 3, we're going to take a look at the, at the Laodicean message. Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean message. Does anybody have at least one verse from memorized from the Laodicean message? Do you? At least one. Did you know Steve Wolberg has started a club, at least he's been trying to start a club, called Revelation Memorizers. He's trying to inspire people to memorize the whole book of Revelation. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good goal. Um, but, the, the, you know, we need to get some of these things in our head. You know, my brain is pretty limited. But recently I've decided I want to learn a little bit from the Old Testament. I've spent quite a bit of time memorizing the New Testament. And I'm not sorry I did. I've memorized three passages from the book of, of Habakkuk, seven of the Psalms. And uh, with those recently, every day, I go over one of them three times. Psalms 1, 2, 15, 23, 46, 91, 126. I really, really, really like the Word of God. It's a blessing. And you get more out of it if you spend some time really drinking, drinking at the same fountain. Don't run too fast from one thing to the next. There's a blessing in it. But let's look at Revelation uh, 3. We'll look at the passage here. I'd like to read it again, and then we'll make some observation about what it's saying. Verse 14 says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things set the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. 
So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that the destiny of the church hangs upon receiving this Laodicean message. It's an extremely important message. One little short sermon is only a peek at it. I want to mention something to you here. I have here wrapped uh, up two charts. And if anybody would like one copy, I have two copies. But it's just simply an overview of Daniel and Revelation all on one page. It charts the main lines of prophecy in a comparative manner all on one page. Uh, Daniel 2, uh, Daniel 2, 7 and 8, uh, Revelation, the uh, churches, the seals, the trumpets, Revelation 13, 17. Kind of interesting if anybody wants it. Uh, I'm not saying this is uh, not in need of some kind of editing, uh, but you, you should get, a, it's, I like it because you get one glance, you can look at Revelation and Daniel, okay? So if anybody will like one of those, I'll be glad to give you one, Okay. So anyway, let's look at, take a look at the Revel, uh, uh, Laodicean message. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things set the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The word Laodicea means, do you, you know what it means, right? Yeah, the, the people judge or the judging the people. Uh, Daniel's name means God is my judge. So this is specifically talking about the time of, of God's people living at the judgment at the end, of course, we know the gospel is being proclaimed at the end of time. Brothers and sisters, we, we need a heightened awareness of our responsibility to God. We are going to answer him. The Bible says, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So the Lord is definitely looking at us. He's, he says to every church, he says, I know thy works. And he's inspecting the fruit in our life, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Of course, if it's evil, he says, I got a happy answer for you. I paid for your sins on the cross, and I can transform the character, which we will look at a little bit later. But it says, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things set the amen, the faithful and true witness. True witness. The, the psalmist said in Psalms 119, he said, thy word is very true. Very true. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. The mind of God stands on an eminence above all of his creation, and he knows what's reality better than any of us do, and that's why we as Christians, when we read the Proverbs, we accept it, where the proverb says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. We trust the word of God above our own hearts. That is not to say that we are to put our brains in neutral and not think and be analytical, though, but it is to say that we are trusting the word of God above everything else. These things set the all men, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus, this, Jesus, when he says here, the beginning of the creation of God, he is not saying, I'm the first thing created. He's simply saying, I'm the agent whereby all things were created. He is the creator of everything. Okay? But he's the faithful and true witness. Do you realize, especially in these last days, in these last days, God is going to develop a group of people who will be like Christ in that the Bible says there will be no guile in their mouths. That means they will not only, in, not only in everyday conversation will they be impeccably honest, but that also means in their doctrinal teachings of the word of God, they will not be preaching error of any kind. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. You know, during Sabbath school today, and I want to comment on this, I heard, uh, as best I can recall it here, I heard uh, the brother mention about someone who heard something about hell or the judgments of God, and he said, he 
pretty much said, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with God. But I, I want to share something with you here. Do you realize that there are people who have gotten rid of, um, of God or turned away from God because they heard truth or they heard a perversion of truth? Okay. Do you realize that there are many souls that have been lost because of the doctrine of an eternally burning hell? Okay. Okay. Now, I'm looking now at one side of the coin. Now let's go to the other side of the coin. Do you realize that there are many souls who have been lost because they have had a, present, a fairy tale presentation of the love of God? You know, I heard a preacher uh, speaking once, and he told about a friend who had been going to a certain church, and the friend told him, he said, I quit going to that church because he said, I finally came to the conclusion that if I continued going to this church, they would love me right into hell. You know, brothers and sisters, if your mommy is really, really nice and really, really loving, does that mean when you jump out in front of a semi, you're not going to be squashed? I'm just trying to rationalize here a little bit. Look. Some people dump the word of God because it has been wrongly presented to them. Okay? Some people dump the word of God because they simply don't want to follow Christ and take up their cross. We don't know all the motives why, but look, wait, here's what God is looking for in these last days. He's looking for a people who have a Christ-like character. They emanate not only the justice of God, but the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God. And they have doctrinal correctness because they are students of the word of God. You see that? And the Lord needs a group of people like this that will represent him in these last days. It may as well be you. Right? And it may as well be me. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Can't Jesus take fallen defective human beings and transform them into his image. Isn't that right? You know, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that by beholding we are changed. Uh, three selected messages, page 183, says that the message for this time is that by beholding we are changed. How many of you have heard the story of Harry Orchard? You ever heard that story? I'll tell it to you in a real quick snap. Well, kind of quick. Fairly long story. There's a whole book about it. Here's a man who was a very wicked man. He was part of the unions out west many, many years ago, about 100 years ago. And he was hired by the union to shoot the governor of Idaho, Governor Stunenberg, or kill him, however we however get the job done. They hired him to get the job done. So Governor Stunenberg was married to an Adventist lady. He was not a Christian. He was not a follower of Christ, but he was a very good moral man. He went to the meetings of the union men one time, he said, and he went in secretly, and then during the meeting he stood up, and he said, you better stop your nefarious work or I'm going to put a stop to you. And they told Harry Orchard, they said, get that man. So it took Harry Orchard about a year to do it. He finally went to the town where Governor Stunenberg lived, made a bomb in the motel room, and he put it at the gate of Governor Stunenberg's mansion so that when he walked out the gate, bam, bam, it would go off and he would kill the governor. Well, the Friday night before this occurred, uh, Governor Stunenberg's wife said to him, she said, you, it doesn't, you don't look like you're doing too good. And, and he said, no, he said, I feel like I'm being pulled between good and evil. The next morning, uh, and the, his wife had pled with him. She said, your life is on the line. She said, you need to give your life over to Jesus Christ. You don't know what's going to happen. The next, that very next morning, it was Friday night, the very next morning, Governor Stunenberg got up. He told his wife, he said, I'm going to church with you. So he went to church with him. Whenever calls would come in for doing business, he'd say, no, after sundown, I'll take care of business, but I'm keeping the Sabbath with my family today. That evening, just about sundown or a little after, he walked out the gate the bomb went off and killed Governor Stunenberg. They finally got Harry Orchard. He was a wicked man. He was a wicked man. And anyway, the whole, but he was a wicked man, but he was, he was witnessed to by Governor Stunenberg's wife. She sent him literature. He read it. He was transformed. In fact, when he first went to trial, the judge knew who he was. Like about a year later, uh, the trial was still going on, and the judge told uh, 
the sheriff to bring in the defendant, and the sheriff said, well, the defendant is here, meaning Harry Orchard, he's here with the justice. I don't see him. And in, even in one year's time, he had changed so much in countenance that the judge didn't recognize him. But anyway, the Lord got a hold of Harry Orchard, too, and saved him. But here's the point. Jesus can take weak, worthless material and transform it into his image. He can do it. So it may as well be you, it may as well be me. You know, in the Laodicean message, Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Okay? Do you realize implied in that statement is this very important point? That we all have freedom of choice. And we choose what our destiny will be. If you choose Christ, the devil cannot stop you from following Christ. He may hammer you, but he cannot stop you from following Christ. Right? Never forget that. There's tremendous power in the will, and we can choose to follow Christ. Now, the problem that Christ has, has with his people is that they're lukewarm. <clears throat> you know, we were talking about hell, hellfire today in Sabbath school. And, of course, one of the things that was kind of maybe not art, exactly articulated, but people's misconceptions about God. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, that the Bible says that Jesus tasted death for every man? He suffered the wrath of God for every man. Do you realize that all those millions of people that, have re, that will have refused Christ and will refuse Christ, that Jesus paid the whole load of their guilt and the wrath of God for every single one of them when he died on the cross. Do you think the Lord is happy to see people lost? Absolutely not. In fact, you, when you read the book, Great Controversy, she describes Christ and Satan after the millennium is over, and this is their final, you might say, square off, face to face, and she says, Christ says to Satan, he says, why have you robbed me of the subjects of my kingdom? The subjects meaning the people. Why have you taken from me the subjects of my kingdom? He, even though at that time Christ knows it's over, he can't refrain from this last expression of grief that these, you've taken them. Hmm. Lord doesn't like lukewarmness, brothers and sisters. We got to get over it. And if something is in our life, do you realize there's reading that destroys a relish for the Bible? Do you realize that there is watching that destroys a relish for the Bible? Did you realize that even a lot of watching of videos isn't even good for your frontal lobe? Don't be a pleasure seeker. It's okay to enjoy some pleasure, but you better make sure you're not enjoying pleasure more than God. Don't, don't we dare to be a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Whether it be appetite or whatever else, we've got to put Christ first. And the more we learn of Christ, the more we're going to love him. I want to look here at an idea of verse 18. It says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. What's fire? I mean, symbol symbolically, what's fire? Yeah, it's refining. Yeah, like Peter says, beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Fire, fire is circumstances in life that are difficult and painful, but they refine and they improve the character. Jesus says, says buy of me gold tried in the fire. Did you know that Paul loved Christ? 
This is a hard one for me to wrap around, but did you know that Paul loved Christ so much that he longed to suffer for the cause of Christ? Now, before I go on and comment on that, I just want to make a side note here. Paul was not a sick-minded person in that he merely was, was wanting to have suffering inflicted on him or that he would inflict it on himself. I'll guarantee you, he wasn't slitting his wrists. Do, do you see what I'm saying? But in the context of following Christ, he loved Christ so much that he actually longed to suffer in the cause of Christ. And that's hard for me. You'll read it in Colossians chapter 1. He says that I may fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my body for his, uh, for his name's sake, something like that. That I may fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my body. He was saying, I want to suffer for Christ. You know why? He loved Christ so much. He was so enamored with him that he was willing to suffer for his sake. Now, when it comes to suffering, I do want to mention to you something uh, in, here in the book of Revelation, the previous chapter. Christ said to Smyrna, he said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I, I will give thee a crown of life. Christ says, don't fear it. So, you know, when we go through, I, there's, on some level, I suppose for all of us, there's some level of suffering every day, isn't there? Some kind of suffering. You might bump your shin or, or you have stress or you got pressure. Or, you know what I'm saying? But we should actually, from some perspective, actually embrace these things. We don't want a wrong concept here, but we want to actually embrace these things and say, you know what, God, you're actually doing me good. And did you know the higher the calling for God's service, the greater the discipline and the more severe it is? Look what the Lord did with Daniel before he exonerated him. Look at what the Lord did for Joseph before he exonerated him. And in these last days, the Lord is going to allow his people to suffer. They will, they will do it willingly and they will be faithful all the way to the end. Humble yourselves, Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So I want to get on to this here in verse 20 and wrap it up. I don't want to talk to you too long because I might wear you out. Revelation uh, 3.20, rather. Christ says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. If any man hear my voice and open the door, let me ask you something. Does Christ literally dwell in us or, does his holy, or is it his Holy Spirit that literally dwells in us? It's the Holy Spirit, right. When Jesus became incarnate as Redeemer, he gave up his power of omnipresence and it's the Holy Spirit who takes that role and he comes into the life. So in very veritable reality, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, does come and live in the soul. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, Paul said. 2 Corinthians 6, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. I want to read you a statement here uh, in the chapter, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Uh, I really like this. Desire of Ages, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled, page 671. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. And without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. That interests me. Isn't that amazing? Here you have three persons to the Godhead. They're all omnipotent, and yet they each have their office and their need, in the, even in the redemption of man. It, it says right there, it, the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential to our salvation. Without him, the, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail.
The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Now listen to this sentence. Here's the strong one. I like it. 671. It says, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. There's a whole lot of sin being offered for sale today. Don't buy any of it. I don't care how appealing it looks. Don't buy any of it. You know, a lot of people are going to throw away their eternal life for sensual pleasures. Don't do it. Or whatever other pleasures are out there, don't do it. It's not worth it. He that committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Don't buy into any of it, that or whatever else it is. Sin can be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who will come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. And Christ said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And the vine and the branch, they have constant connection and communication. We are to continually receive of the Spirit of God by continually depending upon Christ. I want to read you a statement here from the book Education because it's nicely explaining. Now, here's how you receive the Word of God. The Holy Spirit. This is page 126. The creative energy, the creative energy that called the world into existence is in the Word of God. This is one of the reasons why Sabbath keeping is so important for our understanding because it reminds us of the creative power of Christ. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts, that means gives, this word imparts power. It begets life. Now listen, page 126, education. Every command is a promise. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. In other words, the word of God transforms the nature and recreates it into into the image of God. I want that power. I feel my sinfulness. I feel my weakness. I feel my need of constant dependence on Christ. I don't want to be far from him. I, and I told the Lord not too long ago, I said, Lord, even in heaven, I don't want to be too far away from you. Now, I don't know how well that's going to work out. Maybe that's a high priority request. But anyway, I think we'll be, um, <clears throat> by, his, by his spirit, he can be close to every one of us, even here on this earth. Okay? Now, Jesus says, to him that overcometh, or rather, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I've talked longer than I'd like to, but do you have maybe five more minutes? You're willing? Okay. I I just want to wrap up with a few thoughts here. I'd like to, to refer to you a statement in the book, Desire of Ages, talking about this very concept. Christ says, Behold, I stand the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Okay. In the book, Desire of Ages, there's a statement that goes something like this. It says, the soul that has given himself to Christ is his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world. You know what a fortress is? It's a place where you get inside and you defend yourself from the enemy. Okay? The soul that has given himself to Christ is his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. 
I like those kinds of promises. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, in these last days, God is going to have a people that receive the early rain, the latter rain. They're going to stand faithful when the Sunday law test comes. The, the keeping of Sunday at the end of time is the mark of the beast. The keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath at the end of time is the seal of God. And we can only resist the mark of the beast, and we can only truly keep the Sabbath, sun, the, excuse me, the seventh-day Sabbath by the Holy Spirit in our life. That's the only way. If we merely have an intellectual religion, that won't do it. It's got to be a reality. It's got to be a connection with Christ. It's got to be dependence upon him by faith. Okay? Now, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Jesus says we are to overcome as he overcame. Do you realize that Jesus constantly obeyed his father and if we will constantly trust in our heavenly father and constantly depend upon him, we can constantly obey him too? He will give us the power to do it. I want to share something with you. As we come to these last days, we're going to be up against the opposition of the powers of the world. All right? And they can look very powerful. In fact, Sin and sin in and of itself is a very powerful principle, and you and I of our own selves and our own fallen nature cannot conquer sin. It is only through Christ that we can conquer sin. But here's what Satan's going to try and do in these last days, is he's going to try and make the wrong look right, which he's already doing now, and he's going to try and make the right look wrong, and he's going to try and make the right look weak and the wrong look strong. He's going to turn it all around. But there's going to be a people who have spiritual perception and they will see that that is all a deception. Okay? In 2 Corinthians 13, 8, Paul said, for we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. You realize the, the, okay, so here's what Paul's saying. If you fight the truth, you'll promote the truth. If you promote the truth, you'll promote the truth. But you can't do anything against the truth, only for the truth. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. All right? In Psalms 19, it talks about the word of God, the statutes. It says how sweet they are, sweeter than the honeycomb. And it says, moreover, them by, moreover by them is, my, is thy servant warned. Moreover by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, it's talking about the statutes of God, the commandments of God. It says, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Okay. Do you think it looked to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego like that they were going to get a great reward for obeying God when they were on the plain of Dura? No. Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to dump you in the boiling pot. But they weren't going to give in. It may look as if truth is being defeated, but it cannot be defeated. When you read Book Great Controversy, it talks about the suffering of the early Christians and Page 41, there's a short sentence that says, by defeat, by defeat, they conquered. That is, they may even gave up, maybe even gave up their life, but they still conquered. There is a principle about truth that it cannot be defeated. It just can't be defeated. When you read the book, Desire of Ages, the, the chapter, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled, she talks about when Christ died on the cross and he cried out, she, he cried out, it is finished. And she says, when Christ cried out, it is finished, she said his name was heralded from world to world throughout the entire universe because they then saw that the government of God was now secure, that it co could not be conquered by Satan, that his insidious manipulations would not seep to the rest of the universe and that he, his demise was sure and he would be overthrown and Christ would triumph forever. 
His name, the name of Christ, when he died on the cross and said it is finished, was heralded from world to world throughout the universe. So when we stand for the three angels' messages in these last days, we are standing for a truth that cannot be defeated because it is of God. Can you think of anybody in the Bible? Oh, there's lots of them. But when they went after God's people, it came right back on them. Remember the story of Mordecai and Haman? Haman said, I hate that guy. I'm going to string him up. I'm going to figure out how to get it done. So he made sure the execution uh, machine was all ready. And then he was going to get Mordecai. And you know the story. Who ended up on that? Isn't that something? Brothers and sisters, we must stand for the right and not flinch in the face of wrong. Many years ago, there was an Adventist mission that was begun in the country of Colombia in South America. They obviously came in to do good and to evangelize the people, and they drilled a well, and they got lots of water. A man lived right next to them who had done all he could to get water off his land, couldn't ever get any water up from uh, digging a well in his place, and he became very angry with the Adventists. And on top of that, he was a drunkard and quite a wicked man. But his wife, wife kind of liked the Adventists, and she would go next door, and she would worship them, with them. And one evening, he heard the singing from next door coming even closer, and it was his wife coming home singing, and he took his machete, and as she came into the house, he threw it at her. Thankfully, she was able to uh, move and dodge out of the way, and she wasn't cut or hurt or killed. But this man decided that he was going to get his revenge because those Adventists had his water. He hadn't been able to get water. He was going to get him one. So he went to town and he bought himself a very strong bottle of poison. And what he was going to do is dump that poison down there. Well, sure enough, they were going to drink it and die. He was going to get them good. So he decided he would do it at night. And he, before he did it, his dastardly deed, he um, decided he would go to town and get drunk first. So he went to town and he got good and drunk and he came home. And he was good and drunk, and he was in a rage, and his wife was there, and he became very angry at her, and he wanted more drink. He said, you scour around the house, and you find me more drink. And in, her, in a frantic, she scoured around the house, scoured around the house, and finally she found a bottle, and she dumped him a glass, and she handed it to him. He gulped down several gulps, and he said, where did you get this? She said, well, the only thing I could find in the house was this bottle hidden under your bed mattress. He said, wife, he said, I've just been poisoned. You've just poisoned me. So the, uh, they quick went to the missionaries next door to, uh, to, try to take him to the hospital. And they put him in the back of the pickup truck, and the wife was there, and a missionary was there, and they attended the man as they went over the bumpy roads towards the hospital. Before they got to the hospital, the man died. But before he died, he lifted his, hand, he lifted his head and whispered into the missionary's ear. He said, God is just. And he laid down and died. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We must remember, brothers and sisters, that the beast power is going into the lake of fire and that they are on the side of failure. And those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will reign forever and ever and travel throughout the universe and be with Christ forever and ever. So all the pains and sorrows of this world are going to go behind us. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. May God bless you. Make your decision for Christ today. Don't allow anything between you and him. Let's shake off lukewarmness by the grace of God. She saints and please stand. Watch ye saints with eyelids waking, lo the powers of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning. 
ready for your Lord's returning. Lo, he comes. Lo, Jesus comes. Lo, he comes. He comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lo, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Lo, the promise of your Savior, pardon sin and purchase favor, blood washed robes and crowns of glory. Haste to tell redemption's story. Lo, he comes. Lo, Jesus comes. Lo, he comes. He comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lo, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Kingdoms at their base are crumbling, hark his chariot wheels are rumbling. Tell, O oh, tell of grace abounding, while the seventh trump is sounding. Lo, he comes, lo, Jesus comes, lo, he comes, he comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lo, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Nations wane, though proud and stately. Christ his kingdom has tenth greatly. Earth her latest pangs is summing. Shout ye saints, your Lord is coming. Lo, he comes, lo, Jesus comes, lo, he comes, he comes all glorious, Jesus comes to reign victorious, lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Sinners come while Christ is pleading, now for you. He's interceding, haste ere grace and time diminish, shall proclaim the mystery finished. Lo, he comes, lo, Jesus comes, lo, he comes, he comes all glorious, Jesus comes to reign victorious, lo, he comes. Yes, Jesus comes. Dear Heavenly Father, we want you to know today that you love us so much that you are thankful for us, for all that you've done for us. We know, dear Lord, that you are all good. God is like you. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that I shall stand the latter day upon the earth, and that he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth victorious. I pray, dear Lord, that you help us to look to the cross of Calvary, to see the amazing sacrifice that was made there, to pay for our sins, to pay for our uplifting, to impart to us power and the Holy Spirit, to bring us into your kingdom, and to give us power, even here in this world, to become like Christ, to win souls for him be transformed into his image and to manifest excellence in our lives, whether we're swinging a hammer, feeding babies, changing diapers, doing clerical work, or whatever we may be doing, that we are here on Christ's mission as his servants to win souls for him. Please put your divine hand upon us, upon the precious souls in this church, any who are joining in online today. Give us the guidance that we need. Keep us faithful in these last days, no matter how hard the devil may hammer us, I pray that you'll help us to stand unflinching and unmoved, and that we will be faithful to you. And we claim your promise that the Lord, after you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake.
Okay, I want to pray yet for the food before we dismiss you. Let's just bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the message that we heard today. And I pray that you will help us to remember, to remember the message and to put it into action. And also, Lord, now as we, we depart, I pray that you will partake of your food. I pray that you will bless our food to our health. And I pray that you will bless the people that participated in it. And, and I pray also that you will be with our conversations this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So actually, the deacons are not here today. Would you care to usher people out, Tom? So if you want to remain seated, just to keep the sanctuary.